everybody. Um, oh, what's your name? Welcome to the session. 1968 and beyond. My name is Roberta Bruno. I'm the director of Arts and Changing America at the California Institute of the Arts. And I just want to acknowledge that this has been a wonderful collaboration between the Armory and also the Aspen Institute. Damien Wetzel and Rebecca Robertson and Avery Willis Hoffman. So we're going to start just grounding us in some art, which is going to be um, a performance, a short reading by Thuy Le, who is a remarkable poet, writer, novelist, and performer. Please welcome Thuy. Thank you. I'd like to recite a poem called Ardor, and it's from Questions for the Moon, which is a series of poems exploring the story of young Vietnamese women from the north who worked to keep the Ho Chi Minh Trail open during the war. And it's a series of poems that looks at their transformation from girls on the trail, because some of them were as young as 14 to women after the war. And I thought it would be appropriate because I think that for those, of, for those who lived through 1968, it was such a revolutionary time, both here in the US and in Vietnam and globally. So this poem is for all of those whose youths were defined by that year and that period. Ardor begins with breath. To feed a fire, one needs a fan. Weren't we that fan? Our bodies, our beauty, our willingness to face unabashedly what awaits. Virgins promised to no one. Virgins determined to taste paradise in this life walking out of feudal darkness into true, sweet freedom and looking anyone in the eye. Thank you. And I want to close with a brief fragment of a Vietnamese lullaby, just to make some Vietnamese sounds in this space on this day, which is the second day of the Lunar New Year. So Happy New Year. We're together. That means we're family. All right. Yeah, more to Meru Congo Nin Nindi Kong Toy Ngo Ngo Di Kong Kong La. Con ơi, con ơi, con ơi, con ơi, đi con. Thank you. So we have 45 short minutes, and I'm going to hand this over to our wonderful facilitator, Jack Chen from the Asian American Pacific Islander Institute at NYU, and now, soon, is it now? Okay, soon, okay, I won't say, but he's gonna go on to another amazing, amazing position. Thank you, Jack. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just want to briefly introduce uh, the members of the panel, but you have the programs which says the biographies, and since we only have such a tight amount of time, we want to not go through them. Please look at them. So to my left is Reggie Harris. I'm sorry, I, keep, you know, I met him for the first time just a few minutes ago, and I keep on calling him Reggie. But there's a, I have a very good friend by the name of Reggie, so I, I just, so excuse me, my, my apologies. Roger Harris. And then next to him is Mandy Carter, Harry Gamboa, who just arrived from Los Angeles, and Stitlett, and, and George Stumpfish. Um, but before we actually begin talking, I just wanted to kind of set up a little bit of a context for really the vision of having something about 1968 and beyond, right? So we're gonna be kind of circling around that, but to give a little bit of context for where we are, first of all, but also 
in some ways to acknowledge, uh, for those of you who are here at noontime, uh, at the very beginning of the conference, really to say thank you to the Lenape peoples uh, whose land and waters this is. And it's only a practice I've started recently, even though I'm a historian, but it's something that um, has been kind of uh, not been something that we've been very good about in New York City especially. And uh, for those of you who were here, George Stonefish opened the event, so we're really fortunate to have George with us right now. Uh, so we'll get a chance to kind of hear a little bit about that. I also wanted to say that we're also in this place, this very particular place, this building, which maybe you've heard something about, but it was really, it's now known as a Park Avenue Armory. It was also really originally the armory for the 7th Regiment. And the 7th Regiment actually started in the Lower East Side of New York. And those of you who have heard of the draft riots of 1863, um, in which um, uh, especially Irish Lower East Siders were being drafted <coughs> to fight, with the, you know, fight in the North, um, to fight the Civil War. And um, there were lots of uh, problems because you could buy out your uh, lottery if you paid $300. And there, were, there, was, there was major insurrection happening where we saw it. And it was the 7th Regiment, which is also known as the Silk Stocking Regiment. In other words, these were the uh, sons of the elites of the, of the city, especially as it was developing, becoming more and more wealthy from the trade and everything else. They were sent down to quell that, that riot. So in some ways, the question of why is this building here and why does it look like a fort in the middle of a city is actually responding to the question that there's been serious conflict within the city as well as, as we think about um, the usual role of the, what became the National Guard in fighting wars overseas, but many of the wars actually continue really internally within the country because of unresolved issues. Uh, so today, we're actually gonna be touching upon some of those unresolved issues that have plagued, really, the United States from the very beginning. Uh, so in some ways, 1609, uh, when Henry Hudson arrives uh, onto the shores and he's greeted by Lenape peoples, is really, in some ways, the beginning context to begin to understand why we're actually here right now. Um, so we're gonna do two um, quick rounds, um, but we're gonna cover, I think, kind of amazing ground because of the people who are on this panel. Um, so the first round we're gonna do is uh, to kind of um, frame 1968 as not simply as many New Yorkers think of as Mark Rudd at Columbia University. Um, but it goes deeper, really. And of course it includes Dr. King, includes Malcolm X, and it goes back really to the mid-50s with the emergence of the non-aligned movements of nations in Africa and Asia uh, and Latin America who are beginning to decolonize, who are fighting uh, wars of liberation that were considered at the time. And um, in many ways, um, I think that's a deeper context that could help us understand what some of the issues are that we're talking about here. So the question of decolonization, decolonization movements in some ways are a larger frame than what we tend to think of as civil rights power movements. So the first round of questions is really uh, to ask each of our panelists to just share a story of what they were doing in, at this time in 1968. Uh, what were the possibilities opening up at the time? And what also were the limits that you began sensing, perhaps, even at that moment? So Nick, we'll just go around this way, if that's all right. So. Sure. Uh, 1968 was a memorable, memorable year for me because uh, in January 1968, I was uh, into my 12th month as a U.S. Marine in Vietnam. And back then, Marines did a 13th month tour of duty. And so with one month left to do in country, I was at a place called Camp Carroll, Camp J.J. Carroll, which was one of the most northern outposts that the Marines had in South Vietnam. We were literally right at the DMZ. And um, my base camp was surrounded by a division of North Vietnamese Army regulars. They knocked out our lookout towers and began a constant barrage of artillery, mortar, and rocket rounds on us every day. And, and so in January, I thought that I was not going to make it home. 
uh, I managed to get out um, at the end of the month um, by loading dead bodies and wounded Marines on a helicopter, and I jumped on the helicopter with them because it was my rotation date. And unlike in the past, nothing could, could get out through the valley, so you had to come out on helicopters. The helicopter brought the dead bodies to division headquarters on Dong Ha, which was a base about 10 miles away. Um, I turned in my rifle and began walking and picked up my pay record, began walking two miles to the airstrip, and the airstrip began being attacked. And um, uh, I made it to the airstrip with another Marine, and we were able to jump on a plane while it was moving. They told us it was a transport plane coming in in an hour, but it wouldn't stop. And we jumped on that plane, and that plane took us to Da Nang, which was a huge base. And from Da Nang, you fly out to Okinawa. Now, I had one more night in country after 13 months in Vietnam. And then Da Nang gets attacked. And so I was thinking that God realizes that he made a mistake by allowing me to live because many of my fellow soldiers had died, guys that were as close to me or closer than, than this panel is right now. And the only thing that had happened to me was I was temporarily deaf. And I thought that God realized he had made a mistake and was willing and was ready to take my life and I was not going to leave Vietnam alive. And um, I made, I had three wishes and a promise. And you know, one wish was, you know, while I was in Vietnam, my, my daughter was born and I used to, to pray that I could get home to see her. I wanted to lay on my back and kiss my daughter. Another wish that I had was that if I got hit, I wanted to die. I didn't want to go home with one arm and one leg. And my third wish was I wanted to play college football because I had read about a friend of mine who was, who was now playing college football at Wake Forest University. And my promise was if I made it out that I would dedicate my life to helping young people so they wouldn't be put in the same situation that I was in. And um, as you can see, I made it out. And then uh, my welcome home was, uh, I landed at Logan Airport in Boston, which is my hometown. And I had on my uniform and all my medals and ribbons on my chest. And I walked out to the sidewalk and six taxi cabs went by me and wouldn't stop. State trooper stepped out and stopped the seventh taxi and said, you have to take this soldier. And, and the cab driver looked up at both of us and said, but I don't want to go to Roxbury. And I was wondering, how does he know where I live? And then it hit me. He doesn't see soldier. He doesn't see Marine. He sees a nigger, and niggas live in Roxbury in Boston, and he wasn't going there. And that was my welcome home. Then two months later, I was stationed at Quantico, Virginia. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And my unit got called and was issued M16s with live ammunition and told to go quell the riots in Washington, D.C. And looking at the same equipment that we had in Vietnam, I refused to go. I had been up for sergeant. Uh, I was taken off the list. I was fined. I was penalized and sent to a sub base out in the woods for refusing to go because I thought I would be put in a place where I'd have to kill black people, and I didn't want to do that. And so I was penalized for that. And so I spent my last year in the Marine Corps bitter and resentful for a lot of reasons. It was the middle of the, it was the height of the civil rights movement. You know, I was like an outcast. Uh, black folks were calling me and other uh, Marines that had gone to Vietnam traitors. White folks weren't accepting us because we were black. And um, it was just a, it was a bad time for me in 1968. When I think of 1968, in a way, it's almost depending on where you were living. I was living in San Francisco Bay Area. And we had just got done, in my opinion, being part of the baby boomers, um, thinking about a lot of the pictures coming out of the South, the civil, right, civil rights movement. But because we're in San Francisco, we were protesting the war in Vietnam. And because of the uh, Alameda uh, Oakland Induction Center, uh, a lot of us had done Stop the Draft Week. And so I'm intrigued to be on this panel with you, Roger, because I think it's interesting that all these years later, if we look at where we've been, and the fact that we're on the stage all these years later talking about why this issue is important. But two other things I think really defined 1968. April 4th, 1968, and the, and the murder of Dr. King was probably the most amazing, per, persuasive, pervasive thing in a cloud that hung out there for years. But then there was the Poor People's Campaign on the Mall in 1968. There were nine caravans. I came with the San Francisco caravan, two buses. 
And one of the places we had to go through on our way to the mall where we had Resurrection City, the shanty town, was Louisville, Kentucky. There had been a threat on the buses, so we had to have the two buses stay overnight where they have the Kentucky down, where is that, the Kentucky Derby, uh, whatever. We get to the mall, I spent two weeks there. That was a whole generation of us there for there. I have never seen so much rain, it was cold, it was wet. And because of Kennedy being, I'm, I'm sorry, with King being assassinated, during the same time, Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated in Los Angeles. So if you add that into the mix of just whatever the feeling was around the year of 1968, I remember we were going off every day to the House Education Welfare Building, going to different buildings with the, the I think the, the tone, the thing was jobs, um, education, something or other, getting arrested, spending the night in the DC House of De Detention for Women. But then they had this big kind of final July 6th something or other up on the London Memorial, and we all got to go back home. But we, what we had to go back home to was 10 years longer of that war and realizing it wasn't just that war, but the other things that was also happening, black power, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And the challenges of more of the kind of black power, kind of like uh, radicalism versus the traditional, what they might perceive to be traditional nonviolence in the civil rights movement. But I was also there as a black lesbian. And I remember thinking, if everyone's gonna be here talking about all the rights and issues, People didn't use that word, but here we are 50 years later. Can I give you a website to give you an idea that we're gonna acknowledge Poor People's Campaign this year? Poorpeople'scampaign.org, and we'll bring all those issues in it that are relevant for now. I'll end with this. Um, my, I, I, I have a feeling when, when someone talks about what were you doing back in the day, you'll hear this. We're still here. That to me is the most amazing thing, we're still here. And I think, I think, I think one of the things that I'll never forget in terms of how people perceive to be a good war, a bad war, whatever, also from the perspective of women and thinking about this is man's inhumanity to man and the price that women have to play as mother, so on and so forth. But I'm also thinking now because we can make the connections, let's all figure out how we make it a collective we, whatever our stories have been. So, and, um 1968, I was uh, one of the student leaders for something known as the East LA um, Chicano Student Walkouts, in, w in which we shut down the city schools for a week, uh, five schools, uh, protesting the racism against Chicanos, uh, but many other aspects pertaining to the environment. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, not exactly uh, revealed, but uh, Los Angeles is, was a recipient of the fallout of 1,200 nuclear bombs tested in Nevada. Um, by the time I was uh, in high school, um, many of my peers had died of uh, childhood leukemia. Uh, many were suffering from various uh, renal cancers. Uh, the smog itself was irradiated, and actually, just quite recently, uh, because of some of the nuclear uh, problems, uh, they've just discovered that the majority of people living in the San Fernando Valley today have uh, uranium in their bodies as a result of the gas leak that served as a delivery system for the radiation that's been around since the 50s. Um, uh, in the uh, East LA walkouts, I became very um, uh, sort of a focused uh, uh, persona because it's Hollywood, so many of the media uh, would, uh, I'd be kind of on TV in uh, different kind of uh, uh, situations, and I came, I came to the attention of Richard Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover I wound up on a, on a list of what was known as the, um, the, 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 the U.S. Senate published a, a document known as Subversion in the New Left, and I was placed on a list and considered to be one of the top 100 subversives of the United States. And uh, of that, uh, one of the organizations uh, that was listed was uh, Imaginary, and the other one was a, a group I wasn't uh, connected with, and the LAPD, uh, which took its... Uh, its uh, uh, matrix, its uh, substance, actually from uh, Chief Parker, who served as the uh, transitional officer in Nazi Germany to then turn people into the uh, local police, uh, adopted many of the uh, uh, tenants of, of that organization and uh, put it into the LAPD. An LAPD officer, a sheriff, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, a sergeant declared me to be more dangerous than the um, Communist Party and Black Panthers combined. 
And of course, I was 16 years old at the time and a musician. Uh, I just happened to know how to put a few words together and uh, have uh, 10,000 people follow me out of school. Um, it turns out, of course, that uh, during that period, uh, uh, one of the things that's uh, been revealed also was that uh, Chicanos in particular uh, were drafted and uh, died at a much higher rate than their uh, representation uh, in the United States. And actually, the kinds of conditions um, uh, of the area, of which I grew up in Boyle Heights, was actually a targeted test location for military and medical experimentation. And to this very day, uh, just yesterday, for instance, ICE, uh, which California is now a, a sanctuary state, um, has been targeted by ICE. And many of the weapons that are used by ICE actually uh, date back uh, from the manufacturers to Nazi Germany. And that's what's being used to separate and, 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 um, and point it at the children. Uh, they point machine guns at children uh, to kidnap them. And so that's happening today. And it has a direct linkage to uh, 1968. Uh, 50 years later, actually, conditions are actually worse. Oh, it's my time. 1968 was a time of, um, where Native Americans were getting together and planning actions. We had never been really involved or engaged by the civil rights movement. And the very fact is that they were nonviolent and so forth sort of turned us off as Native Americans because we're from a warrior culture. And in fact, when it comes to the military, we have the highest percentage of any group and all of the SEALs, the Green Berets, Rock Marines, and all of the special forces of the military. Another unknown fact is that during the Vietnam War, as Native Americans and members of sovereign nations, we were exempt for the draft unless we wanted to go. However, many of our people went because it's our belief that you, the only way that you can get honor is by fighting wars and defending our territory. So we would go. However, it also came to be that we began to understand our very precarious position in modern society. So in 1979, January, 79 students took over Alcatraz Island in, in the San Francisco Bay. And as a result, they um, basically, uh, I'm trying to pop this sucker up here. <clears throat> they basically made a proclamation to uh, all that the proclamation to the great white father and all of his people, we, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this land and hereby offer the following treaty. We purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24 in glass beads and red cloth, a predecessor sent by the white man's purchase of a similar island 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade beads for the 16 acres is more than was paid for Manhattan Island and was when it was sold. And we know that the land values have risen over the years. Our offer of $1.24 per acre is greater than the 47 cents per acre that the white man are now paying California Indians for this land. And we will give the inhabitants of this island a portion of that island for their own to be held in trust by the Native American affairs. And as the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs shall hold in perpetuality. And as for long as the sun shall rise and the rivers go down to the sea, we will further gut guide the inhabitants in a proper way of living. We will offer them our religion, our education, our life ways in order to help them achieve our level of civilization and thus raise them and all our white brothers from their savage, unhappy state. We offer this treaty in good faith and wish that our honorable dealings with all white men. We feel that the so-called Alcatraz Island is more suitable for an Indian reservation as determined by the white man's standard by this we mean the place resembles most Indian reservations in that it is isolated from modern facilities 
without the adequate means of transportation, has no fresh running water, has less an adequate sanitation facilities, and there are no oil or mineral rights. There is no industry, so unemployment is very great. There's no health care facilities, and it is soil, rocky, and non-productive, and the land does not support game. There is no educational facilities, and the population has always exceeded the land base. The population is always held as prisoners and kept dependent on others. This is fitting and symbolic that ships from all over the world entering the Golden Gate would first see Indian land and thus be reminded of the history of this nation. This tiny island would be the symbol of great lands once ruled by free and noble Indians. And on my second go round, I'll explain why this was a monumental experience for American Indians throughout the United States, Canada, and South America. Clearly, we don't have enough time. <laughs> this is an incredible group of people, and I would just love to spend the whole weekend really talking and hearing their stories. Uh, next round, we're going to look at beyond, right? beyond question of beyond 68. And when I think of the Beyond 68 question, I'm also thinking of, uh, of course, Martin Luther King's Beyond of Vietnam talk, in which he's talking about, uh, talking about the Poor People's Campaign and really linking it up with really Beyond Vietnam and needing to kind of link up the incredible, uh, not just financial, but other kinds of resources and people resources that are being just absolutely destroyed and going into this large, uh, kind of empty, endless hole, right? Um, and he talks about fighting these giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. Um, and in, in this year of 67, it also parallels to the moment of after the Civil War, 100 years before, during radical reconstruction, in which there's a possibility of something happening, something different happening. But that quickly gets subsumed by really what we in New York certainly remember as the Gilded Age, and in some ways we're surrounded by the Gilded Age in this building. Right? And what happens coming out of the Gilded Age in reaction to the Gilded Age is also what's called progressivism. But progressivism is not what appears to be on the surface of all progressive. It's not all progressive because part of what the solutions are our top-down management systems, of which eugenics is actually part and parcel of the progressive movement. So in some ways, the fact that we're all here is not such a coincidence, because I think the explosions of the 60s are in part a, an effort to try to de-eugenicize the way American society had been formulated in all sorts of ways. But also, we're at a moment now in which it's also very telling. Right? So, I think this critical question of what's beyond 68 is something that I know each of us could talk a long time about, but let me just open that up and maybe we'll go around again. And um, our time is getting tight, but let's start with George's time and then come back around this way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that was, uh, what I just read was a proclamation issued by the people who took over Alcatraz Island. And this event for Native Americans was fundamental because it it was a turning point of our being politicized, of the mother and children and the elders taking this whole concept of assimilation that was promoted and pro propagated for us and throwing it to the wayside and re-identifying with our culture. We started growing our hair long, we started going back to our traditions, and so it was a fundamental time for us. It also provided us with creating warrior societies and using our sovereignty to protect our lands so that when we had interlopers coming into our territory, we were more than willing to pick up the same weapons they brought to enforce their law upon us and to fight them tooth and nail. However, as Native Americans, you never really heard about uh, these, these activities. And they started as soon after Alcatraz. And I was there at Alcatraz, because my uncle was one of the people who took it over, one of the 79 students. And my grandmother took me out there to see, and I got politicized out there to see what the possibilities were. I started growing my hair long. I started getting involved again with our tradition and our culture. And Later on, I even picked up firearms against U.S. Marshals, FBI, state police, and defended Indian territories as part of uh, Indian uh, warrior societies. And as a result, um, 
I was a victim of Contel Pro. Uh, my whole family was. Uh, we were uh, targeted by the U.S. government. Uh, they chased me all over the country, and I've been arrested numerous times by the feds, by state, and everybody else. But um, being a New Yorker, I had good lawyers. Well, <laughs> in any event, it was a fundamental part for me, and a fundamental part for Native Americans, because we stand up, and we are now in a position where we are fighting things like um, the pipelines that are going across South Dakota. I mean, our issues with regard to our resources is still very evident and very real today because all of the barren, destitute land that couldn't uh, uh, grow anything or couldn't support game happened to be minerally rich. So right now, our sovereign territories in the United States hold up to 80 to 90% of the country's natural resources, everything from uranium to, gold, or to coal to uh, um, um, liquefied gas to uh, all of this is under our lands. And now they want it. So Trump is trying right now, I said it, Trump is now trying to change our status from one of sovereignty where we're, our land is owned by our nation to one of individual ownership so he can try to come and buy our land for the purpose of energy development and work with the different uh, uh, faith-based uh, energy companies that have been responsible for uh, uh, harvesting these things, such as the Peabody Coal Company, owned by the Mormons. All of these large energy companies are owned by these different religious orders, and they have been used against us since time immemorial, but we are smart, we are educated, our children have gone to college, they're now in a position to fight on whatever battleground they want to choose, whether it's legal, whether it comes down to where old timers like me will pick up guns and, and, and protect our land uh, through physical force. I have no problem facing a government APC run by the US Marshals or the Feds as I have in the past, because when it comes to being native, we are willing to put down our lives to continue to do so for our future generations because this is the mindset that we have always maintained and we shall continue to maintain until time immemorial. Moving on from 1968 to the present, uh, it's only 50 years. Um, uh, it's been, uh, my, my trajectory was in some way to um, address issues uh, theoretically, conceptually, and actually to incorporate them into practice and to uh, uh, kind of focus on the limitation of, 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 uh, of space uh, that's allowed for people to uh, tra traverse, uh, kind of connects to the, the notion of privatization of space. Uh, and, uh, and again, because it's Los Angeles, it's a very strange kind of place. It's, uh, it's a place that's, uh, in which phantoms exist. Uh, the entire city shouldn't actually be there. Uh, it's everything is artificial. Uh, all the uh, plant life, all the animal life has been imported or invasive as well as most of the people. Uh, and, um, uh, and the air actually is, uh, is distorted. Uh, the, uh, years ago, the smog was declared uh, uh, the, the tenants of the, of the city have declared that uh, all pollution must be transparent. And so, uh, and, the co and the coloration of the sky is actually tinted blue uh, to help uh, for the cinematography. And so the entire place is artificially uh, 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 supported on some level. And at the same time, it's a highly militarized uh, location uh, where um, uh, Hollywood is uh, kind of on top to deflect uh, the idea that really uh, the actual uh, uh, introduction of new weapon systems, new control systems, uh, new uh, design systems. Um, the people who happen to live there uh, are subject to various forms of, uh, of oppression, uh, but because it's so widely spread out, it's very difficult for any anyone to know what's going on in the, the next block uh, because it's just an enormous uh, amount of space. Uh, my involvement with uh, the work has been to uh, create uh, mirages uh, that exist for uh, one one hundred thousandth of a second and to give them some level of permanence into the uh, American consciousness and international consciousness through photography, through video, through myth, uh, and to generate images that actually uh, aren't there 
and maybe ne were never there, and yet uh, wind up uh, in history books, and wind up uh, actually, uh, one of the most famous ones actually is in the collection here at the Whitney Museum. And so uh, the idea that uh, 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 to create uh, alternate uh, imagery uh, to dispel negative stereotypes has been sort of a, an action. And as I mentioned before, uh, at this point in particular, um, the harshest form of militarized policing is taking place in Los Angeles, actually. And uh, very much uh, on, a, on a grand scale at the direction of Trump, and specifically uh, the man who was elected, uh, his first onslaught was saying that uh, Mexicans, uh, just his outright hatred of Mexicans, uh, and to have us deported from a place, uh, and of course I have Aztec blood in me, uh, it's very difficult to deport me from where my ancestors come from. And so it's uh, very difficult uh, uh, to even consider, and specifically because there was something known as a Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo, uh, which meant that no one would ever get deported. Uh, so it's all a big lie, it's all a big myth, and uh, any movie that's going to be made out of it is going to be uh, rather faulty anyway. And so it's just lived. And so the entire thing uh, floats above the surface uh, like heat waves, and it dissipates each and every night, comes back. Um, and so the action uh, takes place uh, when people blink. Uh, that's when I act. Uh, so you'll never see me. And when you open your eyes, I'm gone. Uh, but at that point, I would have taken uh, the image uh, in which you'll be remembered. Oh. Um, well, now we're now, now we're now in year 2018. I'll keep mine brief. Something I've really been struck by when you think about how change happens in this particular land, and I appreciate you being here, because there's demographic shift going on, which might explain why they're getting nervous about the census coming up in 2020. Um, here's a couple. By 2050, if not sooner, by 2050, if not sooner, this country will be majority people of color. But keep in mind who was already here indigenous to these lands. I was born in Albany, New York, Niskayuna, Valacia, Skaheri, First Nations people. And whenever I hear about, let's protect that border down there, well, who was there first before we became Texas and so on and so forth. But I've also been struck about this notion about um, women who were, when these lands were first settled, the first set of people told, but not you, were who? Women. You can't vote. You can't run for office. You can't serve in the military. And marriage was anything else but equal based on gender. Then you had the slave trade for 300 years literally came here as property and made that journey. And then when we finally got told, but I guess we can consider you a citizen too, we were told exactly the same thing they said to women. You cannot vote, you cannot run for office, you can't sit in the military. We couldn't even get married. We had to do the African tradition of jumping the broom. So what, you see what the demographics I just told you about what that is now? If ever there was a time to be in conversation with each other. The other one I would say is the notion about different kinds of justice now. If I go 10,000 feet up in the air, no matter where you live, no matter where you live, no matter what language you speak, I would suggest at least four things we'd have in common. Clean air, clean water, no hunger, no homeless. Everyone should be access to an education and healthcare. And you can make the list longer in any language you want. But, I think in, in, but then the question would be, what would put us in the same space to have that conversation? So that, to me, when we think about revisiting the Poor People's Campaign or whatever you want to be involved in, it's more relevant than now than ever. I asked Roger a question earlier. What about your children? And who are the children coming up now and the generations that went before us? And what do we pass on in that legacy? And I will just end with this thinking, for me, and this is just a me comment, every one of us has a moral compass. We all do. And every day we get to decide how we want to exercise that. But when you collectivize that, and you think about your people, my people, we people, whatever that might be, and we talk about what the odds might be, um, that would make a pivotal difference. The power of one, I do make it, I think will make a difference. So for us to go back 50 years, what might have been, some people thought, maybe not that great of that campaign that happened on the mall, we're here now. And we have the first African American this, and the first woman that, but the fact that we have to keep on using the term first that means we still have issues. That shouldn't even be an issue anymore in terms of what we can do. So on a scale of one to 10, count me as a 10 and figure out how we all get to be a part of this collective we in terms of where we go. Thank you. Oh. I wish that 
I wish that I wasn't the last person to speak <laughs> because my fellow panelists are so profound. And I've been sitting here trying to think what is it that I could say that could add to anything that's already been, been mentioned. And it caused me to reflect on, on my own past and, and, and my present. And as I mentioned, you know, I managed to 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 get to make it out of Vietnam. I was fortunate, much more fortunate than the 58,000 who lost their lives and the hundreds of thousands who are here in this country who are suffering, you know, homelessness and, and other types of uh, Vietnam-related issues. Um, but I was able to uh, further my education, and I went on to Boston University and Boston College, and I have a PhD, and I've spent the last 42 years working in K-12 schools in Boston uh, as a teacher, as a football, basketball track coach, as a dean of discipline, principal, headmaster. I've been a professor and faculty director at Boston University. I've been truly blessed. And when I was studying for my PhD, I had the honor of being in a cohort, and there was a Native American, there was only two minorities in the, in the 33 member cohort, and one was an, an elder from a tribe in, in Maine. And during our breaks, I used to always go to him because I felt that older folks tend to have much more wisdom than younger folks. And so I would go to him with questions and concerns, and I used to say, why is it that we have to study this curriculum? Why can't we just study things that we want to learn? And we have to, find, form, we have to uh, follow this scripted curriculum, which gets us this degree, and then that degree qualifies us to work for someone else. And what is the, what is the purpose of life? What is this all about? You know? And he laughed, and he pulled me to the side, and he said, the philosophy of my tribe in regards to the purpose of life is to make the path wider for those coming behind us. The purpose of life is to make the path wider for those coming behind us. So sitting up here on this panel and listening to these amazing folks, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. But everyone in the audience has a story as well. And just as you know, I was able to survive Vietnam, all of us have survived something, and we're all here. And we all understand what's going on in this society. And so the question for all of us is, what are we now going to do? Given what we know, what has happened and what is happening, what are we going to do to make the path wider for those coming behind us? Thank you all for listening. Oh. So I'll just wind up by saying something very brief. Uh, a lot of people now will claim that each of us represents some separate identity politics that doesn't care about the other person or the other group. And I know this was not true in 1968, and it's not true now. So please don't fall for that false argument. I think we each see the intertwining of these stories and relationships and the arbitrary separation between what happens in this country, especially as this country started to expand and taking over the whole continent, right? Taking over other places, right? And also what happens in wars abroad, right? So that separation is really defied by the fact that we're really talking about both here and also everywhere else. So thank you all for coming. Um, I know that there's another panel coming in right after us, so if you'd like to join us out in the hallway, we'd love to talk to you. So thank you very much. Thank you.